All right, so this week's Torah portion is called Bamidbar, which means in the desert or in the wilderness, and it's the first Torah portion in the book of Numbers. Now, the Hebrew name for the book of Numbers is Bamidbar because it's taken from the first verse in the wilderness, whereas the Septuagint is the Greek translation from the Hebrew, and they call it the book of Numbers because the first chapter of Hebrew is the census of the children of Israel, but more specifically, the census of the military age men of Israel. So that's why we played all those songs about sound the battle cry, I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord, God's got an army, because that's kind of the theme of today's Torah portion is the army of God. And most people focus on the census and the numbers, but there's some interesting things in this Torah portion. So before we go any further, let's uh, uh, have the blessing over the reading of the Torah. Baruch Adonai Hamvarak, blessed is Adonai the blessed one. Baruch Adonai Hamvarak Leolam Vayed, blessed is Adonai the blessed one for all eternity. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Bachar Banu Mekoh Hamim, Venetin Lanu Et Torato, Baruch Adonai Noten HaTorah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and has commanded us to engross ourselves in the words of Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the Torah. And as it says in Psalm 119, Lord, open my eyes that I might behold wondrous things out of your Torah. The Torah, the five books of Moses, is the springboard for the rest of the scripture. The entirety of the scripture is based on the five books. So if we don't get the five books, we're not going to understand the rest of the holy scriptures. So even though our Torah portion is Numbers chapter 1 through 4, I'm going to start out in the Torah portion of Yitro, <laughs> which is all the way back in Exodus, to bring us into our Torah portion today. Because it's talking about the military armies and encampments and the soldiers of the children of Israel. And Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, Yitro, uh, he kind of gave Moses some advice. He says, before you get an army, you have to have leaders. And so these are the optimal requirements for the leaders of Israel. So it says in Exodus chapter 18, uh, beginning with verse 21, uh, it says, But you should seek out capable men out of all the people. Men who fear God, men of truth, who hate bribery, appoint them to be rulers over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Let them judge the people at all times, and then let every major case be brought to you, but every minor case they can judge for themselves. Make it easier for yourself as they bear the burden with you. If you do this thing and God so commands you, then you will be able to endure um, you will be able to endure, and all these people will go to their place in shalom and peace. So Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. Moses chose capable men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, rulers of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. They judged the people all of the time, and the hard cases they brought to Moses, but every minor case they judged for themselves. So we see that the uh, optimal requirements... Uh, for leadership in the army of Israel and to be a judge in Israel, to be some sort of leader over thousands, tens, etc., was you had to be capable men. So what was the definition of a capable man? Well, number one, it says that they had to fear God. Fear God and keep his commandments. I mean, Solomon even said at the end of Ecclesiastes, here's the conclusion of the whole matter. Basically, this is the meaning of life, is to fear God and to keep his commandments. So they had to be God-fearing. Because if you're God-fearing, you won't do anything wrong. I mean, I know about the fear of God, and I learned the fear of God by fearing my parents. I had a lot of opportunity as a teenager to do wrong things, but I didn't because I feared my parents. Not that they would kill me, per se, or punish me, but part of the fear is I didn't want to hurt my parents. I didn't want to disgrace or tarnish our name. I didn't want them to be ashamed or disappointed in me. When my parents told me they were disappointed in me, that hurt worse than a spanking. And I don't want to hurt God. I fear God too much to hurt him. So they had to be men that feared God, that didn't want to hurt God or harm him or in, in any way. When you fear God, you will keep his commandments. They had to be men of truth. Now, today, truth is, is subjective. Oh, it's my truth. It's your truth. What's true for you may not be true for me. That's just a crock of bull. Truth is truth. 
1 plus 1 equals 2. 1 plus 1 doesn't equal 4, 5, or 7. It doesn't equal 7 to you and 4 to you. It's either 1 plus 1 equals 2, and anything else other than that is a lie. It's the same thing as the Robin, uh, the, the, the Baskin Robbins flavor of genders. There's not 31 genders, there's only two X, X, and XY. That's science. It's not emotion, it's not touchy feely, it's science. So if you don't have truth, you have nothing. And even Paul the Apostle said, if the resurrection isn't real, if the resurrection isn't, isn't true, and it's just all a sham and all a hoax, we of all people are most miserable because that is the basis and foundation of our faith is that Yeshua, Jesus, rose from the dead. So these capable men of leadership had to be God-fearing, had to be men of truth, and they had to hate bribery. I remember the WWE, well, it was WWF back in the day, and you had Ted DiBiase, the million-dollar man. Everybody's got a price, right? And he would bribe people, you know, to get what he wanted or to win matches or whatever. And it's interesting that... Uh, he wasn't really a millionaire. That was just the gimmick that, uh, um, you know, the president of WWF wanted for him in his character. But he really lived that lifestyle to, to as much as he could. And uh, he ended up cheating on his wife and ruining his family. But that low point broke him and he became a man of God because it was his wife is a believer. And he ended up repenting and getting saved and getting back together with, with his wife. Now he's a minister of the gospel going around teaching and preaching about God's word. But you have to hate bribery because a bribe perverts justice. It perverts truth. You, you see so many peer-reviewed studies from you know, MIT or this place or that place. But you know what? Whoever sponsors and pays for that study gets to dictate the outcome of that study. The study itself is doctored. You can't depend on a lot of studies because of bribes, because follow the money. You know, you want to know what, what a, a particular, you know, news outlet believes? Who's paying the bills for that news outlet? Who owns that news outlet? You will know why they're saying what they're saying on the news. So these leaders had to be capable men that were God-fearing, men of truth, and they hate bribery. And uh, verse 25, it reads, let's see, yeah, Exodus 18, 25. Oh, turn the page there too soon. Okay. Moses chose capable men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people. So in other words, Moses was able to find men that met all those requirements. What a shame that would have been if, if he wasn't able to find in all of Israel men that didn't meet those three simple requirements, God-fearing, men of truth, and they hate bribery. But he found them. So that's the leaders. But today we're going to talk about the soldiers who are under those leaders. So there's always a chain of command. People say, well, I can't wait till I grow up and get on on my own and I'll be my own boss. Well, I hate to break it to you, but you're always going to have somebody over you. Whether it's somebody you work for, whether, it, you, know, whether it, you join the military, or whether it's the government, you have to pay these taxes or whatever. You're always going to have somebody over you that you have to submit to and listen to and obey. So in Numbers, Bamidbar, and it's interesting that Bamidbar, the Hebrew word Bamidbar means in the wilderness. But you can switch the Hebrew letters around, and they could also mean to be spoken to. And the rabbis say that the reason that God led the children of Israel out into the wilderness is so he could speak to them. Because in Egypt, there was too much ruckus. There was too many TVs and social media of Egypt that Israel couldn't hear God. He had to take them out of Egypt into, into the wilderness so they could be quiet enough and silent enough and undistracted enough to hear him. And sometimes we find ourselves in a spiritual wilderness, a spiritual desert, and it's dry. And we're like, God, where are you? I'm right here. That's the whole point. That's why you're here. Shut up and listen. And so in uh, Numbers chapter 1, verses 1 through th 3, it says, In the wilderness of Sinai, on the first day of the second month, in the second year from the exodus from the land of Egypt, Adonai spoke to Moses in the tent of meeting, saying, Do a head count of all the community of Bnei Israel, the children of Israel, by their families, their ancestral house, with the total of every male, one by one. You and Aaron are to muster by their divisions every son from 20 years upward available to serve in the army of Israel. So you've already had several censuses by this time. You had the first census when they went out of Egypt, the second census right after the, uh, the incident of the golden calf because a lot of them died, and then you now you have this third census. Well, the first census 
was a census for everybody. Second census was to find out who was left. The third census was not of everybody, just only military-aged men. So this was specifically a, 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 like a draft, if you will. So just because they were 20 years and older and a warm body doesn't mean that they were necessarily soldiers. They were eligible to be soldiers, but it doesn't mean that they were warriors. Just as there was requirements to be leaders, you had to be capable, God-fearing, truthful, and hate bribes, there was requirements to be a soldier. So it doesn't really give the requirements. I guess the requirements are that you have to be at least 20 years old and upward. That's really the requirement. But there are some disqualifying things that will disqualify you as a soldier. It would have disqualified these 20-somethings and up as soldiers if this was found out about them. And we read about these disqualifications in another book of the Torah, which is Deuteronomy. That's my favorite book of the Torah. It was Jesus' favorite book of the Torah. But in Deuteronomy chapter 20, verses 1 through 9, it reads, When you are going out to battle against your enemy and see horses and chariots, a people more numerous than you, oh my gosh, we're outnumbered. What does the Lord say? Do not be afraid of them. For Adonai your God, the one who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now that brought you up from the land of Egypt, embedded in that phrase is that realization, if I could deliver you from the gods of Egypt, and if I could defeat all the gods of Egypt and leave them powerless and impotent, what do you think I could do to these human agents of these gods? They're nothing to me. For Adonai your God, the one who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, is with you. It, it's, it's amazing when somebody's with you. When you were a little kid and you were scared of the dark, even if you had your teddy bear with you, that was something. You felt a little comfort there, but it was even better if mommy or daddy crawled into bed with you. If somebody was with you, and one of the tests of manhood in some Native American cultures is that the young boy would be blindfolded, and the only thing he would have in his possession was a knife, a flint knife. And the, the, the men of the village would lead him out blindfolded into the wilderness and set him on a rock or a tree stump, and he had to stay there all night. He couldn't run away. He couldn't move. If he did, he wouldn't have passed the ritual. He thought he was alone, and he had to test his own mettle and experience his own bravery. But little did he know his own father was there watching him all night long. And when we're in the dark, and it seems like we're walking blind, and we don't know where we are, we don't know where we're hearing all those scary noises around us, and we want to run and, and hide, we can't see our Heavenly Father, but He is there with us. We are not alone. Just as that young native boy was not alone in his test of courage, we're not alone in our test of courage. But it says, when you draw near to battle, the Kohen, the priest, will come forward and speak to the people. Everybody needs a pep talk. You know, just like, just like a football game, you know, the coach in the locker room, okay, boys, we're about ready to play the finals here. And, you know, this, uh, we, you know this, this group that we're playing here, they're pretty rough, and they've won every game, and, you know, this is make or break time. And he gives a pep talk and says, we can do this and all that. So it's the same. The priests, the, the Levites, would have this pep talk. When you draw near to battle, the Kohen, the priest, will come forward and speak to the people. He will say to them, hear, O Israel. You are drawing near today to battle against your enemies. Do not be faint-hearted. Do not fear or panic or tremble because of them. Why? Verse 4, for Adonai your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. My sword, my bow, my javelin, my gun, my Uzi, my tank, my rocket launcher can only go so far. It can only do so much. Having a supernatural element, having God fight for you. Wow. And even today, Israel is only the size of the state of New Jersey. And how many wars have they had? The Six Day War, the Yom Kippur War, this war, that war. But they've won every war. And they've been outnumbered. You, you had Jordan and Syria and Egypt all against them, wanting to drive them into the sea, vowing to do so. And each time, Israel is outnumbered, outgunned, outmanned, and yet they still survive. And even some of the enemy accounts will tell you, we've seen angels batting our missiles out of the air. Israel can't be touched. 
So God it says, God will fight for you. For Adonai, your God, is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. The officers are to speak to their... So you have the priests. You have that the, the, the clergy, the, 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 you know, padre. Father Mokehi, giving a pep talk, if you will, those who are MASH fans. And, uh, you know, then you have your, your leaders. These, these qualified leaders who feared God, that were men of truth, that hated bribery, they were the ones to speak next. The officers are to speak to the troops saying, what man has built a new house but has not dedicated it? Let him go back to his house. Otherwise, he may die in battle and another man would dedicate it. So that's the first disqualification for a soldier. You get out of the draft if you if you are a new homeowner. Okay, so it says, verse 6, What man has planted a vineyard, but it has not put it to use? Let him go back to his house. Otherwise, he might die in battle, and another man would begin to use it. Second disqualification, if you started a vineyard or orchard or farm. I don't think that these were necessarily disqualifiers. I think these guys could have still volunteered says, yep, we realize the risks. We realize the danger. We're going to stay anyway. But yet if they walked away because of those things, it, it, no, no judgment. It wouldn't have looked bad on them. But they were given the opportunity to leave. Verse 7, what man has come engaged to a woman but has not married her? Let him go back to his house. Otherwise, he might die in battle and another man would marry her. So if you were newly engaged, newly engaged is basically being newly married. You just haven't consummated the marriage yet because the engagement was almost like a year long where the man would go back and build a house for the wife and plant a garden for the wife. And, and the woman would spend the year preparing, you know, learning how to be a good wife, what have you. And this is another interesting thing. Oh, I wish this was the case today. It was a law in Israel that if you were a newlywed, you basically had the year off. The only responsibility a man had was to please his wife. Doesn't that sound good, ladies? That's the only thing a husband had to worry about was to make his wife happy for an entire year. Boy, I wish I, man, I wish we could still do that today. Huh? <laughs> so that was another disqualifier. All right, verse 8. Uh, it says, the officers will speak further to the troop and say, what man is afraid and faint hearted? Let him go to his house so he doesn't weaken his brother's heart like his own. So if he was a scaredy cat, that was another disqualifier. And to me, that was a non-negotiable disqualifier. These other reasons, newly married, starting a vineyard, you know, new homeowner. I think they could have said, you know what? We realize the risks and we're OK with that. We're going to fight anyway. But if you were scared, that was going to disqualify you permanently because you know what? Being scared is like a cancer. It's more contagious than any disease. You have one person in the group that's afraid. It's going to pass through the whole group and you're going to get a mass hysteria as a result. I mean, look at David and Goliath. David was not a part of the army. He was just a small shepherd boy. But his dad said, hey, go send your, your, your brothers who are in the battle, three of your brothers, send them some food. Also, you know, their commanding officers, there's some food for them, too, as a gift. So little did David know, but yet this giant, this almost 10-foot giant was coming out every day, you know, talking trash, saying, my God's bigger than your God. Any one of you fight me. We don't have to have a bloody battle. Just get one guy to fight me, and if he wins, we'll surrender. If not, you guys will be our slaves. But what happened? Every time Goliath came out. Every single soldier would go and hide in their tent. They were scared. Now think about it. If all the Israel ganged up on Goliath, they could have took him. Just one guy. It's like ants. You know, there's a bit, you know, like a big scorpion or something invades an ant hill. Well, that scorpion is deadly and it's bigger than all the ants, but all the ants gang up on that scorpion and can devour that scorpion within a matter of minutes. Can overwhelm. But here David comes along. Just, you know, barely, you know, barely over his acne. <laughs> you know, he's a teenager. And then all of a sudden, Goliath starts talking trash. He's like, wait, hey, hey, where did everybody go? What, what, what is this? You guys are going to stand back and take this? You know, it's not like he's trashing your mama or your girlfriend. He's trashing our God. Nobody gets away with that. So David, a shepherd boy who had no experience shooting a bow or swinging a sword, I'll take him. Hey, I've protected sheep against, you know, bears and lions. This Philistine ain't nothing. 
So with a sling and a stone, hitting the only unprotected spot on Goliath, he kills him. So David wasn't afraid, but the rest of Israel was afraid because, you know, obviously they didn't let the soldiers go who were afraid and it infected the whole troop. But David wasn't a part of that army. He came in from the outside, therefore he was unaffected by that fear. And so 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 4 says, No one serving as a soldier entangles himself in civilian affairs so that he might please his commanding officer. We don't have time to goof off and play around in the spiritual kingdom, in the spiritual world. We are soldiers in the army of the Lord. Therefore, there is a chain of command. There's rank. There's specialties. There's soldiers who, are, who specialize in tank operations and communications and, and you know, artillery and infantry, whatever. We're the same. We have our gifts, <clears throat> our talents, and our specialties. But we all work together as a cohesive unit to accomplish a mission, a goal, a task. So we don't have time to mess with these petty little dramatic civilian affairs of Twitter and Facebook and whatever else goes on in our life because we are soldiers in the army of the Lord. The children of Israel may have disqualified themselves as being a nation of priests because of the golden calf incident, and therefore only Levites who didn't participate in that was qualified to be priests. But you could still be a soldier. But the most important thing is don't be afraid. Because 2 Timothy 1.7 says, God has not given us the spirit of fear. Fear is not an emotion. Fear is a spirit. Fear is a demonic entity that we give permission and allow to mess with us if we start entertaining that fear instead of taking our thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5, and say, nope, I'm not going to think about that. Nope, I'm not going to fear. I command you to leave in Yeshua's name. I take that thought captive. My God is bigger than anything. My God can take this. So um, I want to read to you a portion from the Gospels in the book of Luke, chapter 14. Chapter 14, starting with verse 28. For which of you wanting to build a tower doesn't first sit down and figure out the cost to see if he has enough to finish it. Otherwise, when he has laid the foundation and isn't able to finish everything, all those begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and wasn't able to finish. You know, I'm sure that a lot of your daddies said, now I don't condone fighting, but if you have to defend yourself and you're in a fight, if you start something, you better finish it. That's the thing. If you start something, you better finish it. And so that's what basically Yeshua is saying here. If you start something, finish it. And that's what we do in our spiritual warfare, in our fight. We don't surrender in the middle of a fight. We don't retreat in the middle of a fight. We stand our ground just like, just like David's mighty men. Talked about that one, uh, one of David's mighty men who was, I forget, was it a barley field or something? He stood in the middle of that barley field and defended that field. And if I'm re remembering the same guy, he fought so hard for so long that after the fight was over and he defeated all those guys, one guy against a dozen or so, it says that he couldn't even uncurl his fingers to let go of his sword because it just cleaved to his sword. He fought so hard. The Lord was on his side. Remember uh, Jonathan, Saul's son? Boy, he was brave. He had, he had a backbone. The Philistines are like, <laughs> look at this, guys. Oh, these Israelites are coming out of their little hidey holes. Jonathan's like, oh, yeah? And they're like, uh, hey, he told his armor bearer, he says, hey, if they invite us up there, we're going. It's like, uh, hey, why don't you come up here, guys, and we'll teach you a lesson. All right, so they climbed up the, the, the cliff, and they beat the pants off those guys because he knew that the Lord was with him. So in Luke, it continues on saying, or what king going to make war against another king won't first sit down to consider whether he is able with 10,000 to confront the one coming against him or with 20,000. If not, while the other is still far away, he sends an ambassador and asks for peace. So in the same way, whoever does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. So you remember the battle of AI? Oh, AI is just a little outpost, just a little rink-a-dink, hole-in-the-wall, backwater town. You don't need to all these people, Moses. Just a few of us can take them. But because of Achan's sin, because they were sin in the camp, that little small number that usually would have done the job, they got the pants beat off of them. 
because there was sin in the camp, right? That's kind of another sermon for another time. But um, I want to go to now to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting with verse 33. It says, Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. So why do I why why do I bring that up? That doesn't really seem relevant to this whole soldier army thing. Well, if you read our Torah portion for this week, it not only talks about the census and the making of Israel's army, but it talked about the encampments. Who was camped next to who? You know, what tribes camped together, what direction they were camped in, what banner, what color symbolized them, what banner they camped under. Well, it's interesting that the tribe of Reuben was camped next to one of the Levitical clans of Korah. Reuben apparently was a bad influence on Korah. Because you remember what happened with Korah and Reuben? What did they do? They tried a coup d'etat against Moses and Aaron. Hey! What makes you think that you could be priests? Well, well, who do you think you are, Aaron, that you could be priests? Hey, aren't we part of the same family? Why can't we be priests too? Why can't we be priests and sacrifice and all that? Why do I have to lug around and carry around the furnishings of the tabernacle? We're priests too. And they had that little contest with all the censers and stuff. And then God shot down fire and burnt up all of them. And then the earth opened up and, and swallowed some, you know, in another incident. Bad company corrupts good morals. Come to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. So it, just because somebody calls them a believer and somebody says, I'm a, I'm a Christian or I love Jesus or I follow God or just because somebody goes to church doesn't mean that they're in the army of the Lord. We got to watch out who we hang around with, right? Because we can be influenced. I remember Tracy's testimony. Well, I had, a, I had some friends that drunk, and I thought that if I could hang around with them, I could share with them Jesus. And guess what? I started drinking again, too, and I, I backslid. Oh, you know, I love this guy. I know he's not a believer, but I can change him. <laughs> uh, that no. work for somebody that's not that, 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 <laughs> yeah <laughs> right you can't change somebody the, that's why the bible says do not be unequally yoked that's in the context of business practice but it applies to relationships outside of business and even paul the apostle said when people come into the church and they sin and they're habitual sinners and won't listen to the leadership and won't correct things and won't repent kick them out Oh, that that hurts people's feelings. That 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 sh we can't shun people. What are you afraid of losing some offering money? Is that it? Is that what your motivation is? No, they're a cancer. They're going to corrupt. If they're not going to go along with the rules in the program, you kick them out and let God deal with them. And if they repent, bring them back with open arms. But if not, let them go. Even Paul the apostle said, "You know what? There's a couple people I had to hand over to Satan <laughs> because they just weren't going along with the program." And what happens? When somebody is in the army and they do not follow what their commanding officer says, they either go AWOL or they are dishonorably <laughs> discharged. They don't say, oh, well, we understand you had a rough upbringing and we're going to be patient with you and we're going to get you in this, to, this program to help set you on the right path. And then, you know, you could resume your, your, your duties. No, they're like, sorry, you're dishonorably discharged. We've gave you chance after chance. Hit the road. And that is a black mark on that person. So, you know, I want to hang around people that love the Lord and that are serious about the Lord, not just people that say that they love the Lord or just want to have the moniker of Christian and love Jesus, but yet sleep around on the side or get wasted on the weekends or, you know, <coughs> cursing like a sailor during the week or whatever. So we got to be serious about being a soldier of the Lord. And that's why it was, it, it was detrimental on, on, on who we hang around with. When we see that example with Reuben, Reuben influenced in a negative way Korah, who was a Levite. But the Levitical clan of Korah eventually repented. After that incident, when a lot of people got burnt up, there's a lot of psalms that are written by the, the sons of Korah. And they are totally dedicated to the Lord. After that, oh, we learned a lesson, God. We know who we're going to follow. We're not going to follow Reuben. We're not going to follow our older brother, even though we thought he was cool. 
we're going to follow you, Lord. And they repented and become one of the most dedicated clans of all the Levites. They wrote a lot of the Psalms. Uh, in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20, it says, He who walks with wise men is wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm. We were talking about the prodigal son earlier. He suffered harm because of who he hung around with and who he spent his money on. And he ended up slopping pigs. So it's time to cut people. I know what I'm saying is not popular. I know what I'm saying is not nice. And I don't mean it in a, in a derogatory, mean way. But I'm saying sometimes we have to cut people off if they're not the fellow soldiers that they need to be. Not that, that we're going to treat them badly. Not that we're going to hate them or talk bad about them. But we don't need to be in their influence, in their circle. Judges. The book of Judges, chapter 7, starting with verse 3. So now, make a proclamation in the ears of all the people, saying, Whoever is afraid or anxious may turn back and leave from Mount Gilead. So 22,000 people turned back, while 10,000 remained. So Gideon obeyed what was declared in Deuteronomy 20. And he, he declared, if anybody's chicken, go home. We don't need you. We don't want you. If you're not up for this spiritual fight, you're not up to fight for the Lord, then go home because we don't want you to infect us all. And it's interesting and it's kind of funny because this ties into what Mike and I were talking about on the way here. Revelation 21.8, we talked about disqualify, what, what's qualified for a leader and disqualifiers for a soldier. Well, here's a disqualifier right here. One of the disqualifiers for a soldier was being afraid, right? You can't be a soldier if you're afraid, if you're fearful, because that's going to infect everybody else. Well, being a soldier and being a believer are one and the same. Being a soldier and being a believer are synonymous. You can't separate the two. Because Revelation 21.8 gives the disqualifiers for a believer. But for the cowardly and faithless, so cowardly means that you're afraid, you're, you're fearful. Faithless means you don't obey God's commandments. You say you love Jesus, you say you do, but you don't live it. And the detestable, the murderers, the sexually immoral. You know what? These are things that are accepted by the church now. The church is saying, it's okay to murder babies. It's all right. Just a blob of tissue. Don't worry about it. Sexually immoral. You could still, you could still be a leader in our church and be sleeping around with somebody. Oh, but it's common law. So I guess you're pretty much as good as married. And sorcerers. Somebody who's dabbling in the new age. Oh, yes, I, I love to read the scriptures, but you know what? I like to have a tarot card reading every once in a while, or, or it's kind of fun to get my palm read. That, that's happening in churches, too. Oh, but they don't call it tarot cards. They're destiny cards. They're different. It's not a Ouija board that they're messing with. It's, it's an angel board. So it's totally different. And idolaters putting anything above God. I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. I'm of this preacher. I'm of that preacher. Don't follow me. Don't follow anybody. It says Yeshua, Jesus is our rabbi. He is the one that we should be idolizing. And all liars, they are, their lot is the lake of fire, which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Fear is a disqualifier of a soldier. Fear is a disqualifier of of somebody who claims to be a believer. You can smell them out and skunk them out, smoke them out. When you read Revelation 21, 8 and line it up with somebody who says, oh yeah, I love Jesus. Okay, well, let's see. Uh, uh, you're disqualified, right? Now back to Judges chapter 7. And we're going to wrap, wrap it up here really, really quick. I'm glad you guys have the stomach for hard messages. I really do. <laughs> nobody's nobody's run off again. yet. Elisha, <laughs> uh, when they, uh, he showed his uh, sure. body, the, the angels in the, in the... Yeah, Lord opened his eyes and he, he saw the armies on the army, mountains. Uh, yes. the angels on the mountains, yeah. There's it's, more for us than against us, yes. yeah. So cool. Good point. Yeah. So in uh, Judges chapter 7, still dealing with this, this uh, story of Gideon, 
starting with verse 4. But Adonai said to Gideon, the people are still too many. So he had 10,000 and 22,000 left. So they're still too many. Bring them down to the water and I will test them for you there. Now it will be that if he whom I say to you, this one will go with you, he will go with you. But anyone whom I say, this one will not go with you, he will not go with you. So he brought the troop down to the water. And Adonai said to Gideon, you are to set apart everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps. And everyone who bows down on his knees to drink. Now the number of those who lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, was 300 men. But all the rest of the people bowed down on their knees to drink water. Then Adonai said to Gideon, with the 300 men who lapped, I will deliver you and give the Midianites into your hand. So let the other people go, every man to his place. So the, so the 300 took provisions for their, and their shofarot, their ram's horns in their hands. And he sent all the other men of Israel, each to his tribe and each to his tent. But he kept the 300 men. With God, we're never outnumbered. 300 men took on an enti- the nation, an entire nation, the army of Midian, with just 300 men. So you know what? The numbers are against us. Churches and synagogues are closing all over at epidemic rates. People are now going to New Age and humanistic philosophies and not even, even professing any kind of faith or religion. We're not welcomed in our workplaces. We're not welcomed in the public schools. You can have Jesus in your heart, just don't bring him to work. You can have Jesus in your heart, just don't bring him to school. So there's few of us in number, and we're a remnant, and we think, oh, we're losing the battle, we're losing the war. David beat the entire Philistines just by conquering Goliath, and he was just one little boy. Gideon beat the pants off the entire Midianite army with just 300 men. Jonathan beat those Philistines when they said, yeah, yeah, come and show us what you got, little scaredy cats coming out of your little hidey holes when you trust god and believe god he will fight for you and we are in the army of the lord and we will win though we are few in number we are a remnant and you know what it's a remnant that gets the job done there's an army there's there's the american army but not all the army are green berets right green berets are a specialty group you know, they, they, they're they a special unit that could do things that the other army can't. We're a remnant. We are God's specialty force. We are God's A-team. And God has us around for a reason. He saves the best for last. We may think we're not nothing. We could have lived 50 years prior to this. We could have lived 100 years ago. We could have lived 1,000 years ago. But God chose us to be born right here and right now because he wanted us in the fight. He wanted us to be born right now because like Esther, we were born for such a time as this. And he wants us to fight with our gifts and talents and be that remnant and not be discouraged because we're few in number. That's a good thing because it means the cream of the crop is left. It's God's special forces. Even when an army couldn't take out the bad guy, Rambo could. Even when an army couldn't save all the MIAs, Chuck Norris could. We are God's Rambo. We are God's Chuck Norris. We've got God on our side, so it doesn't matter who's against us. And if we trust God and we're true soldiers and we don't disqualify ourselves as soldiers, we are going to be victorious. We're going to win. Doesn't mean that we're not going to suffer, suffer battle scars and wounds. We will. We're going to get wounded and hurt in the fight. But guess what? God's not only our general, he's our healer. And he will be glorified through our sickness and disease. He will be glorified through our battle scars and wounds. And then we can show our scars and wounds. And say, look what God brought me through. See, this scar here, this represents a time in my life when this happened. And God saw me through and brought me through. And, and, and these scars are badges of honor and trophies that we carry around on our bodies to show that God fought for us and we overcame. We were wounded, we were injured, but we came out on top. I will live and not die and declare the goodness of the Lord, one of the, one of the scriptures says. All right, I could keep going on, but I'm going to stop. So we'll go, we'll go ahead and uh, close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would encourage each and every one of us because with what we hear on the news, what we're seeing in society and, and, and the mood of, of politics and, and the mood of the workplace and, the, and the, the, the neighborhood and things around us, we really want to throw in the towel and give up and, 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 and we get discouraged. But Lord, we're seeing – you said that this was all going to happen before it happened. You said to expect this. 
Don't be surprised when this happens. But at the same time, you said, I will be with you even until the end of the age. And this age is winding down to a close very, very fast. But yet you have us here for a specific time, place, and purpose. And that's to fight for you, to glorify you, and that you can get glory and honor through what we do for you. David had his mighty men. We are your mighty men and women in your army. And help us to be proud soldiers and realize that we've got to please you, our commanding officer, and not please ourselves or those around us. The fear of man is a snare, the scripture also says, but you have not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And the scriptures also say, I think it's in Philippians, that I can do all things through Christ, through Messiah, who gives me strength. So, Lord, we thank you that you've given us gifts and talents, but, Lord, that you are on our side. Sometimes we may feel like we're standing alone, but because you are there, we may not be able to see you or even feel you sometimes, but you are there. You and I, Lord, make a majority, and we will always win and come out on top. We may lose some battles here and there, but just read the end of the book of Revelation. We win. We win. And those who endure to the end will be saved. We love you and praise you and ask these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. Yevareka ka Adonai vishmareka, yeer Adonai panava leka veyakuneka, yesa Adonai panava leka veyasem leka shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Bashem Yeshua Moshienu in the name of Yeshua our Messiah. Amen.